back again for true born believers. Open your Bible to Luke chapter 22, verse 19 and 20. It will direct us to our discussion for this moment. Luke 22, 19 and 20. And when you found it, say amen. amen. And then stand. And if you don't have your Bible, then uh, there should be one in the near vicinity that you can share. Or the person who has their Bible does not mind you sharing it with you. Amen. amen. May we all stand together to honor the word of God. Luke, the 22nd chapter, and the two verses, verses 19 and 20. Let us read those two verses together. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, verse 20. Are we together on verse 20? Oh, okay. Okay, well, you, you all read from the King James then. Okay, L let's begin from the King James, verse 20. Go ahead. Amen. You might be seated in the in the NIV. It says that this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which means a new contract, which is poured out for you. Jesus was not only talking about his disciples, his followers at that moment in the upper room, but he was talking about all that love the Lord and that have been born again. I want to talk about the last parable, the last parable. All of us, well at least some of us I should say, have been um, taught that the definition of a parable is a earthly setting with a heavenly meaning, right? at least those in evangelism, that's what we've been taught. But I want to somewhat give a slight variation to it. A parable is a story that is told to help us to understand an idea. A parable may also be something that a person does as if they were living the story in the presence of the individuals that they are trying to teach. Jesus told many parables while he was here on earth. And the pur his purpose for telling parables was to have his followers know how precious they were to God the Father. So he told them beautiful stories, stories again that centered around the practical elements of life and what life was about and giving lessons and principles in terms of what the kingdom was about. Case in point, when we look at the disciples' prayer in Matthew where it says, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed, sacred, blessed be your name. Your kingdom come here on earth as it has always been in your home in heaven. In that prayer, we see where Jesus is telling the disciples that the purpose of the kingdom is to bring the peace and the joy of heaven and to make it a reality here on earth. 
I don't think there's anybody here this morning that would not agree with me that in terms of all of the turmoil, the confusion, the chaos, the killings, the hurt, the pain that's going on not only here in our city but all across this nation, that if there was some way to resolve it, to stop it, for lives not being lost, then we would be happy. Don't you think so? The parables that Jesus told, if you turn to the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel, and you're familiar with those three stories. The first one is about the shepherd. The second one is about the woman that had silver coins. The third one is about the boy that left home. In the first one, he said that the shepherd had 100 sheep. And in the evening, which was a part of the Eastern setting then, when he brought the sheep in from grazing during the day and counted them as they went in to the enclosure, he missed one sheep. He counted 99. One was not there. So instead of being satisfied with the one, he went out seeking the one sheep. He found the one sheep. He brought the one sheep back. And then he called the other shepherds in the neighboring vicinity and told them to come and to celebrate with him because he, is he had found one lost sheep. Then he follows that with the next story of a woman that had 10 silver coins. She misplaced one. And instead of forgetting about it, she swept the house clean until she found that missing one coin. Then she told her other neighbors to come and to share in the celebration that she had found the one coin to put back with the nine. Then he ended up with a third story, which was the story of the young man that left home as his father, without waiting on his father to die to get his inheritance, his money, he asked him ahead of time to give him his allotment. He left, and I'm going to be skipping over a lot, but you know what happened. He went, Jesus said, into a far country. The far country ravaged him, just like a predator destroyed him, and he ended up being in a hog pen. And then he realized in terms of what had happened in his life, that at home was better than what he was going through in that far country. And he came back, and the father, in fact, he had even devised a, an excuse, an apology, and had asked the father to forgive him. But when he got to a home, the father told him he wasn't interested in his apology. All he wanted was that his son had come back home and that his son was safe. Now, Jesus teaches in these parables that God is like. Implant that in your mind. God is like the shepherd. God is like the woman. God is like the father. What does he mean by God is like? When he says that God is like the shepherd, it means that God so loved the world, that God is willing to pay any price to save those souls that are lost in the world. For the world will destroy your life. God is like the woman that had the ten coins, lost one. He's like her in the sense that this woman was distracted. She was preoccupied with doing other things. And inadvertently, she misplaced that coin. How is God like that woman in that story? That the world can distract you the world can take you away from your goals, from your vision. The world can get you preoccupied in other pleasures 
and then destroy you and let you down. God is like, in the third story, he's like the father. In that story, the father did not demand that his son apologize to him. He did not stand afar off and tell his son, I'll think about it, or that the son had to bring penitence to him and repent. He told the boy, I'm glad you're home. Your apology is not necessary. The most important thing is I love you, which means that God the Father loves his humanity so deeply. Now, don't, 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 don't ask me, well, Pastor, why does he love fallen sinners? I don't know. Not only because he made us, but there's also another reason behind that. And that goes deep into the heart of God, something we will never understand in this life because we do not have that type of love in terms of relationships. But we do know one thing, that God loves us more than we will ever understand. Amen? And he wants us to be saved from sin and become his loving and obedient children. So all three stories point to what? Jesus Christ, God the Father. Now, when we look at these two verses, Jesus is what? He's dining with his disciples in the upper room. This is the last Passover that he is going to be sharing with them on this earth in the flesh because after his resurrection, 40 days later, he's going to send a cloud. He's going back to heaven to be with his father. The choir was singing, he's coming back again. Notice that in scripture, God doesn't tell us when he's coming back. Right. Now, there have been a lot of stupid, foolish men that have tried to predict that God was going to return at such and such a time. In fact, I think there was a prediction in the 70s, one in the 80s, one in the 90s, one in the 2000s. Well, one thing that men will eventually find out, you cannot, you cannot bend God to your will. You cannot predict the mind of the eternal. Our minds are finite. His mind is infinite. He has a mind that at the beginning, in the first chapter of Genesis, he didn't even have to use his hands except for, for making his creatures. But all he had to do with his mind was speak. And things came into existence. Things that were not became things that were in the book of Hebrews. Now, you can't comprehend that. I can't comprehend that. God doesn't ask us to comprehend, understand by, by logic, by reason, being pragmatic about it. He doesn't ask us to do that. All he asks us is one thing. The love that I give to you, you give that love back to me through faith in my son, Jesus Christ, who came down, became the image of who I am, because in the Old Testament, men never did see God face to face. God moved in his power. He demonstrated his wisdom, his omnipotence, his omniscience. But they never did see him until the New Testament. And then what we just read in the responsive reading and what? God became flesh, which means that what? He came into existence, what? In the form of his son, Jesus Christ. But Jesus said, when you see me, you have seen daddy. What I am like, that's what he is like. What I do, that's what he's already done. So don't ask for me to see Jesus. I mean, forgive me. Don't ask for us to see God because God is in Jesus Christ. Here he is in the upper room the last time dining with his disciples, and he tells them, I have eagerly longed, what? To be here and to eat the meal 
and to enjoy your fellowship for the last time. The word eagerly means that he intently wanted it. He wanted it so desperately, so badly, until he was willing to do something about it. Amen? Now, looking at these two verses that we were reading here, we see that Jesus was living out his last parable. When he said, this is my body, my blood, what was he actually meaning? Because whenever we come to the first Sunday in terms of our tradition here, and in most black African Baptist churches, which the first Sunday is celebrated in terms of the Lord's Supper, and we do it so methodically, we have done it so long until it becomes a mechanical thing and it loses its meaning, its power, and its significance. It's just like when you buy a brand new record or a CD and you keep on playing it over and over and over again. When you first play it, it's sharp and clear, you enjoy it. But the more you play it, what? It starts wearing down. And if you keep it so long, after a while, then when you put it in, it starts to skip it. And the sound dies down, goes up. Then after a while, you're going to have to throw it away and buy you another one. Amen? What does he mean by my broken body? His body, he, he, he wasn't literally talking about his physical body. Because the prophecy in the Old Testament tells us that when he dies, the Messiah, not a bone in his body will be broken. So we know he wasn't talking about the literal physical body. Well, what did he mean when you eat this bread, symbolizing, representing my body that will be broken for you? He was talking about his life his life, who he was. For he made many statements. He said, light has come in to this dark world. Men enjoy darkness rather than the light. He said, I am the light of the world. Anyone that comes to me, what? Shall never perish, but have what? Eternal light which means unending life, everlasting life. Now, don't try to understand that because there's nothing here that we have seen with our physical eyes that does not die, is not broken, is not torn up, is not thrown in a trash can. Everything in this world has a limited existence. Amen? Nothing in this world goes forever. The only person that goes forever is Jesus Christ. And he, and, and, and th think about it from this perspective. If he lives forever, he has eternity in him because he is eternity. And he can give you eternity if you believe and trust in him which means that you will become like him, you will have an everlasting existence. Does that make sense? What he has, he wants to give it to us. But the problem that we have is that sometimes we think we know more than what God knows. Or we become disobedient and we want to charter our own path in life. And then when things get rough or we hit a snag, then we call on the Lord to come and to help us, to deliver us. And then after that, we go right back to our same old path. God says, I am giving you me. Let me, let, let me use another earthly analogy. Everybody here is familiar with the relationship of marriage. Is that right? What does a marriage take? Two people. One person can be married by themselves. 
Is that right? It takes two people doing what? Coming together, joining what? Not only physically, but joining what? Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, agreeing basically on the same thing. Now, 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 we realize that coming from a human perspective, we're not going to have 110% perfection, right? But on the basics, we come together in a relationship. And since God created the institution of marriage, he said that it's supposed to be what? Until death. Now, let's say it another way. It's supposed to be enduring for the rest of your limited earthly life. That's basically what it amounts to. Because I ain't going to be here no 200 years. So as long as I'm physically here, that's how long the marriage is supposed to last. All right. Now, God says, in faith, when you receive my son, Jesus Christ, I can give you a relationship that goes beyond what a marriage relationship is. Marriage relationships, it models in a small way what our relationship with God through Christ models. But the difference is the marriage is limited. It breaks off at death. There is no death when it comes to eternal life. Death is not present. Remember, Jesus made a statement one day. He said, if anybody is going to follow me, first of all, there must be death in their life. You must deny yourself. That means death. I died to me. I died to Barna. I died to my aspirations, my dreams. My hope. I died in terms of what I want out of life how I determine I'm going to get it. I must die to me first, but in order that the death become final, then I got to take up a cross. So from death to death. <laughs> in other words, God allows me to what? To surrender. But you see, there's a problem with our surrendering. Sometimes we ain't going to surrender everything. We're going to give up what we want to give up and then hold on to what we want to hold on. But now when he puts us on that cross, that kills everything. You can't hold on to nothing when you're hanging on the cross. <laughs> the cross will destroy all of you which means that you will have to say, all I surrender, all to Jesus, what? I give. So he says, I am giving you me, my broken body. Not literally, again, but figuratively speaking. This is an analogy. And as we eat the bread this morning, we are not eating the flesh of Jesus Christ. Get real quiet. Because there are some of us as black Baptists, we don't understand the doctrines of Scripture. That's a doctrine of the Catholic Church. That when you take the Eucharist, you're literally eating the flesh of Jesus and drinking his blood. Now common sense tells you, does that make sense? Do you see any flesh in that bread? Do you see any plasma in that wine? When you get through analyzing, it's still going to be nothing but wine with some alcohol in it. <laughs> Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Now, after he has finished renovating us, then we are prepared to what? Follow him. Because you don't argue with him then. 
you say to him, whatever direction you want my life to go, you got a better plan for me than I have planned for myself. His broken body. The second thing was, he said, my blood, which is poured out, freely given, lavishly given. I, I am glad to give my blood. In the Old Testament, it said that without the shedding of blood, there is what? What does that mean? No forgiveness of sin. Okay, now why is it that without blood being let that there is no forgiveness of sin? Let's look at this from a physical standpoint. You can have a great set of lungs. You can have a strong heart. You can have a very keen and a very vibrant mind. But if all of the blood physically is drained out of your body, will you live? So therefore, the life of the body is in what? The blood. Physically, it's in the blood. Spiritually, it's in the blood. And Jesus is saying, I am pouring out my blood. I am giving myself. I, 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 there is no reservation in me. I am open and I'm doing it not only willingly, but lovingly. Now look at the recipients who are receiving the broken body and the blood. Low down, lying, cheating, murdering, adulterous sinners. Look at who we are. I don't care, you know, and you, 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 can, you can pretend to yourself, well, you know what, I don't know about them, but I don't do all of them. I've been, you know, ever since I grew up, you know, I never did steal anything, and I never did say any curse words or blah, blah, blah. That doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. You ain't perfect. You were born in sin. We live in a fallen world. If you were perfect, you wouldn't have to be saved. So don't come with that baloney. I don't care how good you think you are, you ain't good enough to save your own soul. If you were, then Jesus Christ wasted his life on that cross. We need a Savior. Amen. We need somebody that can do for us what, well, let me say it this way. I need somebody to do for me what I can't do for myself. And when Jesus died on that cross, scriptures tell us that we were ransomed from sin. The word ransom means we were brought back again. We were redeemed. That's where the word redemption comes in. We were paid for. We were paid for not with silver or gold or jewels or money. We were paid for with the death, with the life of Jesus Christ. Can I give my last analogy here? How many of y'all have ever been to a pawn shop? Pawn shop. P-A-W-N, a pawn shop. Okay. Is there anybody here who doesn't know what a pawn shop is? Because they advertise on enough on TV. Okay, you know what a pawn shop is. A pawn shop is where if you need some money, you carry your favorite item, you carry it there, they will evaluate the value of it, they will give you money for it, then they will give you what they call a pawn ticket. Now you hold on to that ticket, cause if that's a valuable item, you want to come back and get it later, right? But you can't get it later without that pawn ticket, right? Okay, now when you bring that pawn ticket back, you gotta pay for your item that belonged to you initially at the beginning, you gotta pay for it twice. Dear God.
Does you get it? In the third chapter of Genesis, God made us free, eternal. We were not made to die. There were no cemeteries before you get to the third chapter of Genesis. There was no death before the third chapter of Genesis. Death didn't come in until Genesis 3, where what? When we, and when I say we, I know you and I were not there, but Adam and Eve represented us, so therefore us as was there. Death didn't come in until the third chapter of Genesis when they decide to do their thing their way. Death came in. Cemeteries start to growing. And when you read the Old Testament, when you read about the patriarchs like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though they lived longer, but you always read a paragraph that says, and they went to their fathers, which meant they died. Even if they lived 150, 200 years, they died. Death was not abolished, destroyed, done away with until Jesus Christ died. And the reason why, in his death, death was destroyed is because he had already destroyed death before he died. And somebody's saying, Pastor, that don't make sense. Let me explain. The prince of this world is Satan. Is that right? Who created, who made Satan? God did. Who has more power than Satan? God does. Do you think God is scared of death? Mm -mm. No, no, he ain't scared of death. And that's the reason why when he died, his death was the only death that could die and be resurrected because if I had died, I would still be dead. Abraham died, he was still dead. Isaac died, he was still dead. Jacob died, he was still dead. They didn't have a hope of eternity until Jesus Christ died and then got up out of that grave. And when he got up out of that grave, hope came back. Light came in. Darkness was dissipated. Notice there in 1 John, it said that, that the darkness has tried to, try to comprehend, try to overcome, try to understand the light. Darkness can't do it. Satan can't defeat God. How can the creation defeat and destroy the creator? Impossible. But oh, the third day he got up. Yes, he did. You don't take my word for it. Read his word. That's what he said. Because if, if you try to take my word, you say, well, the pastor's embellishing that. He's lying. He's blowing that out of proportion, you know. Maybe I believe him. Maybe I don't believe him. I don't care. It ain't my word. You don't have to take my word. You read his word. You take what he said about himself. Well, you said, can I depend on his word? Yes, you can. Because in 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, it wasn't just him getting up out of that grave, but we are told that there were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. And God always has a witness. Yes, he does. This is getting good now. This is my broken body. This is my blood. Sin pulled us away. Jesus said, I'm going to what? Buy them back again. Why? Because they belong to me from the beginning. Because I made them. And I'm buying them back with my death and with my blood. And he received us. Now, the question is, do you know him? 
I'm not talking about in a knowledgeable way. It's a, a atheist knows about Jesus. An atheist might be able to memorize more scripture and more Bible than any of us as Christians can. But that doesn't mean that he has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. He still denies the authenticity of Jesus. He denies him in terms of being his Lord and Savior. Do you know him? Do you know him not by what somebody else told you about him? I've been told and I see on the TV about President Obama and they tell me what he says and does, but I don't know President Obama personally. Do you know him by personal experience? Flint knows some folk over there where he works personally that are in high positions with authority. I don't know those folks. I know about them for what Flint tells me of them. But knowing them directly, I don't know. But Jesus, I know him. And I read his word because I want to get closer to him. But if I never, if I got blind and I wasn't able to read no more, I know him. And I don't need nobody else to tell me about him because I met him a long time ago. And you know, and I'm through, you know what? If you really have a genuine, real clash with God, because see, some of us have to struggle with him. Some of us, some of us ain't going to go freely when he tries to deliver us out of the bondage of sin. Some of us will struggle because we love the pleasures of the world. And some of us say, no, I don't want to. But however the struggle was, when you finally had to submit to him, can't you remember that struggle? Let me say it another way. Can't you remember the day that your soul was saved? You may not remember the exact moment or hour. You may not even remember the place where it was. But can't you remember when God saved your soul? When he finally, when he finally tracked you down, he broke you in half, and you had to say, yes, Lord, on the inside. Don't you remember that? And you don't need me to verify it. You don't need me to authenticate it, because you know it, don't you? How do you know it? You know about personal experience. And it's not an emotional thing. It's reality. It's real. Like the, song, like, like the songwriter said, he's real. How do you know he's real? He's real way down in my soul. He's real. So we are here today because of a life, because of a character, because of a surrendered life to God the Father, because of light that came into the world. We are here because of Jesus Christ. If Jesus had not died, there would be no reason for us to waste time to be here this morning. Anybody can come together and can celebrate a whole lot of things. Wherever the St. Louis Cardinals are playing today, there's a lot of folk that have come together and collected there on their stadium to celebrate hopefully the Cardinals' victory. Folks celebrate anything, so birthdays, deaths, you name it. Folks celebrate a lot of their marriages. Some folks even celebrate the divorce. I've seen it. I've seen some crazy folk in this world, people that were insane up here. So what folks celebrate that doesn't cap it off with being holy and divine. But this is God's celebration. And we are the invited guests. And we should not come reluctantly. We should not be here, well, this is another Sunday. Boy, I sure do hate getting up out of the bed, you know. Oh, my Lord. Let me get up and get dressed and shrug on out there. And I sure do hope the service is short so I can get over to the mall because I need to do some shopping today before tomorrow for my children. School is getting close. I need to buy some clothes for them. Blah, 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 blah. 
You know what I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, me why you're laughing, because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> if tradition or uh, conscience, bad conscience, has got to whip you to bring you out here, you came for the wrong reason. You ought to be here because you love the Lord. That's all. Why do you think Kenneth Johnson and Connie Johnson, who are celebrating their anniversary, and I don't know how many years it is, I don't even know where they went, that ain't important. Why do you think that they decided that this day is important for them and that they have to celebrate it and that they are glad and happy to celebrate their anniversary? Because they are joyous over the relationship. And because they love one another. When you love Jesus Christ, you want to celebrate his life, death, and resurrection. And he's more real than individuals that we can lay our hands on. Because one day, this is going back to dust. And I won't be able to touch it no more. But Jesus is real. Can't see him with your naked eye. But we are told that those things that are not seen are greater and have a more profound reality than the things that we're looking at right now in this world. And when you think about it, it makes sense. Because the things that we see here today, what? They are gone tomorrow. But Jesus Christ, what? Remains the same yesterday, today, and what? Forever. The invitation is extended. The last parable that Jesus portrayed and lived out in that upper room, he did it with his own life. And with his own life, he demonstrated that life doesn't have to end at a grave. They don't have to put a tombstone over your remains and write on their RIP and the date you were born and the date that you expired. And somebody said there's a dash in between the physical birth and the physical end and the more important thing is what happens in between on that dash that's somewhat true. But I also want to add, it is more important is what happens after the demise. What do you mean, preacher? What I'm saying is this. God said that there is a world beyond this world. Can't see it? But in the 11th chapter of Hebrews, it tells us that there is a land that is beyond this land. It tells us that faith is the substance of things, what? Hoped for. But the evidence of things. Uh, well, Pilgrim, why, why are you trudging through here? Why are you going through all this hell you're going through? <laughs> it's because I'm going to a better, better place. And he's told me that that place where there'll be no more dying, There'll be no more what? Heartache, headache, no more losses, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more mourning. Wouldn't, doesn't it, can can, can I use a colloquial expression, doesn't it wet your whistle to know that being in Christ, when you die, you're going to a place that you won't have to be bothered with this mess down here no more. Doesn't that make you more eager and determined to make certain that you get there? Maybe to you or not, but it sure is for me. It's a great incentive to get out of this mess down here. When I was younger, I wanted to stay here, you know, because I felt as though I had a whole lot of things I wanted to do and accomplish. But see, now, when you reach, and some of us are at that juncture in life, 
where we're not looking ahead anymore, but we're looking back. Amen? And most of our life has, is behind us, not that much in front of us. So, like Paul said, he said, I pray that out of all the preaching that I do, and all the souls that God saves, that I don't end up in the end losing my own soul. I want to make certain that I see Jesus. And that's the reason why you have to guard your soul. Because the world will lure you just like putting bait on a hook to lure fish.